Welcome to Eggshell Transformations, a podcast for intense people. My name is Imi, and I'm here with you on a journey. Hi, today we talk to a real expert on the subject of giftedness, Lisa Van Gamma. In this conversation, we talked about Lisa's definition of giftedness and how it differs from mine, what existential depression actually is, Lisa's definition of perfectionism, and why there can be a healthy functioning form of perfectionism. We discussed the existential problem of loneliness when you can't find your people and do not feel like you have anyone to lean on. Career advice for the gifted and why autonomy is key. In the last part of the conversation, Lisa gave us some really good concrete advice that you can work on now if you're struggling with the label, your identity or your self-esteem. I really appreciate Lisa sharing her expertise with us. She's really an expert in this field and it shows. This conversation has helped me refine my thinking and learn. Whether or not you identify with the label gifted, I think you can really learn something from this. Now to Lisa. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's a true pleasure. Yes. Um, when I saw your bio, I just thought, mm, you know, I have to interview her. You, it, I probably I should leave it to you to talk a bit more about your career and how you have come to this point. You work a lot with giftedness and you've written a book about perfectionism, which I think it's so relevant to people I work with. So you might have seen that I work with intense and sensitive people. Um, I think a lot of people are still dancing around the word gifted. A lot of people don't want to identify as such. So maybe we can also talk about why that is. Um, But before we start maybe you can tell us a bit more about yourself and what brought you here so i'm an i would call myself technically an educational consultant because mm-hmm. the irs which is the u.s tax authority <laughs> <required> <laughs> to name that's the, my that's the definition <laughs> yes. yeah i have to call myself something um what i say that i'm trying to do is make the world safe for gifted kids and i do that by speaking and writing and yeah. My educational background and most of my career background is centered in this by being an educator. And I was the youth and education ambassador for Mensa for six years. And really? so I, I have come to this profession from my own personal experiences as um, being a gifted kid in school and then raising gifted children and, and then being an educator as well. And you have already alluded to it that that there's a problem with recognizing one's inherent giftedness because there's a bias against it and yeah. this bias is different in different cultures to some extent it's cultural yeah. um it depends on whether the culture is uh one that knocks tall poppies yes uh, yes or yes or whether it's one that is more individualistic. So collective cultures uh, struggle with giftedness more than cultures that are individualistic. Mm. But even in individualistic culture, you Mm. still get that idea of like, how dare you? It sounds so arrogant. And I think that's so weird because giftedness, I I feel like the reason we call it gifted is because it's a gift. Like you didn't do anything. You didn't, you didn't ask for it. And like any human trait, intelligence is going to be on a bell curve, right? Some, some people are going to be taller. Some people are going to be shorter. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be smarter and some people are going to struggle to learn. And that's not, that's not good or bad. Giftedness has no moral value. Giftedness doesn't make someone a good person or a bad person. It doesn't make them effective. It doesn't make them successful. It's just another human trait. Yes. And it being a neuroatypical trait, actually, like many other atypical traits, it comes with quite a lot of suffering because you don't know how to fit in. People don't really understand it. Mm. Yeah, I was interviewed. I have a series on my website called Interview with a Gifted Kid. And normally I conduct these interviews by phone. But yesterday I was interviewing two sisters, um, nine years old and one about to turn 11. And so we did it through Zoom so that I could do both of them at the same time and know who was talking. And at one point when I was asking 
I was asking, has how has giftedness impacted making friends? And at first, both of them said, oh, it hasn't, like, it's fine. And then the mother reminded them, like, well, before, because now they attend a school that's just for gifted kids. Well, and the mother reminded them, what was it like making friends in your old school? Mm. And and one of them started crying. Mm. The, it is painful. Like, it's not, it isn't a bed of roses. And it isn't something that people should envy. And because of that, it makes it even more difficult because it's very isolating. Mm. Nobody wants to hear a parent lament the struggles that their gifted kid is having it feels like bragging exactly exactly I think most people still I associate almost purely with IQ but that's really just one dimension and sometimes not even relevant to my mind it comes with many other things like excitability intensity deep empathy is that what you see as well what are some of the traits like complexity depth so I, I would actually not agree that mm. um, we would have a difference of opinion mm. in that I don't necessarily int- see intensities or overexcitabilities, especially if we're talking about the work of Dabrowski, uh, mm. like the, that, the work of the, the, the poles, I call it the polar work, um, the two Polish psychologists who did intensities and overexcitabilities. And I think that that's problematic, actually, right. connecting that to giftedness, because um. It, because it it is used sometimes as a diagnostic tool. Mm-hmm. Like if you see this now, do a lot of gifted kids re- show these traits? Yes, because like any other trait, when you're dealing with a gifted kid, you're going to have it at a more intense level, right? You're going to have intelligence more intense. You're going to have emotions more intense, but, but that alone doesn't help you identify. So the definition I I personally would use for giftedness, and boy, if you wanna if you wanna cause a storm of argument, go to a conference of psychologists and ask oh, them, right? Like nobody yes, can yes. Make consensus. Even the people who are developing the tests, right? Yeah. So, but if you were going to ask me, what I would say yes. is that giftedness would be someone who has a low threshold of learning. And rapid and effective creation of neural pathways. Oh. So can they you repeat learn, that? Can you repeat yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Sure. Thank the, you. The first trait, first thing, first definition of giftedness is a low threshold of learning. That that it doesn't take, and so I want to I want to stay here for just one second. What that means is they learn quickly, so they don't need as much repetition. Mm. That looks like an intensity or overexcitability because when they're in a space where they are learning and they're surrounded by other people and the teacher is needing everybody to learn, then that gifted kid or adult, because you don't get like when you graduate from high school, you don't get a get out of gifted free card. It's not like it's over. They're going to struggle with these things the rest of their life, but they're sitting in a meeting at work and the boss is going on and on and on. And some people are still not understanding. And the gifted individual is like, I'm done. Like, I'm out. Like, I got it the first time you said it. And now I just want to stick a hot poker in my eye. Right. And so that displays as those intensities and overexcitabilities. It displays as hypersensitivity. It displays as arrogance. It displays as all these things. Mm-hmm. But the root of it, the root of it is the intelligence. They learn that, very quickly. Yeah, exactly. And then the and then the second part of that definition I said is that they are effective at creating neural pathways. And and the reason that's important is that whenever we learn something, we're building neural pathways. And mm-hmm. if you have the ability, it like if you and it's not even really an ability in the sense that's not really quite I, we need a word that means you just were born with this thing. And so you have it, but it's not anything to brag about. It just is what it is. Um, Then like nobody asked me to justify why I have brown hair, you know, like it it is genetic, you know? Um, So when you can, um, I think what gets a lot of people confused is sometimes these intelligence are not global, meaning people can be very intelligent in one aspect, but really not okay in another aspect 
And so I think they have a word for it as twice exceptional or something like that. But it's all jargons. But I, I do want to hear your thoughts on it. Can a gifted person be highly intelligent in some or even most subjects or domains, but really not in others? Well, absolutely. And especially if you start bringing in emotional intelligence, mm. right? So, uh, I wouldn't even stretch that far yet. I was just thinking about being really good at literature and really bad at math. (laughs) Well, I think that what you do look at is is, is that in general, intelligence would have some base fundamental ability to learn. Now, you're going to definitely have people who have preferences and through those preferences. So people listening may have may have read books like The Talent Code or even Outliers or things like that. And we realize like that that the idea of prodigy is fake. And so it's very difficult to tease out. It's very difficult to tease out how did this person become more a math person or more a science person or more a literature person? Because what we don't know is did Do they really naturally have ability in that area or was that ability like did someone notice something, start nurturing it and send the child the message? Mm -hmm. You have this ability and then combined with those combine those messages with fundamental baseline ability. And then you get this idea. So the idea of like Mozart, just this piano prodigy who just sprang out of nowhere is false. The idea of like, the, those sisters who played chess is just like they just were born with this amazing chess ability. False. Like it was very much environmental. So when we're looking at giftedness, we're looking at this very complex interdependence of nature and nurture. And all through the exploration of the psychological impact of, of giftedness and looking at the changing view of psychologists toward giftedness over time. And we've gone back, you know, the tabula rasa that, that children are blank slate, but then switching from that to it's completely genetic. Right. And, and now we're more and more realizing it's almost impossible to tease out um, nature from nurture. Although identical twin studies are very helpful with this and identical twins who have been separated at birth and yet have astonishingly similar lives and career paths and things like that. So we do know that genetics is stronger than we would like it to be, right? Because we like to believe that if we just put enough, if, if we could just make every home that a child grew up in equal, then everybody would be equal. But that's just simply not the case. The humans are much less egalitarian yeah. um, than we wish we could be. Yeah. What did the identical twin study found? Fine. So identical twin studies find that even when you separate children, uh, separate identical twins at birth or soon after that, and they're raised completely separately, often with no knowledge of the other person, when you meet them as adults, mm. you will find shocking similarities down to like they, they yes. frequently have the same career. Um, in, in one of the famous studies, they ended up marrying women with the same name and they like they drove the same car. And they, they had like, like weird things that you wouldn't think of. Um, there is one identical twin study that was done in Canada um, that was quite interesting. Um, identical twin studies are focus on case studies, right? Because you're not going to have some group of separated identical twins in a town near a university where a researcher could research like 4,000 separated identical twins. But one of the studies that was done in Canada was done on two girls who were um, adopted from China by Canadian couples. And when the couples showed up in, at the orphanage in China to adopt the girls, realized that these two girls were twins. And they there was like this kind of King Solomon moment where one of the families said, we'll give our daughter up so that she could be raised with her sister, but the government would not allow it. And so they each took the daughters home and they lived um, apart they didn't live near each other but they intentionally had the girls get together like they raised them knowing they were sisters the girls knew but what was astonishing is just even miles and miles apart how 
very, very similar. I'm not going to say identical, but shockingly similar. Their development was the the words that they first said, the the developmental milestones that they yeah. hit, even though they were being raised in different homes. And so we find that genetics is not insurmountable. It isn't not malleable. Intelligence is absolutely malleable. And I don't think you can really separate completely emotional intelligence from cognitive intelligence because people with more emotional intelligence will learn more. And there are other aspects to it too. Like if you look at the studies that have been done at the University of Toronto and also at Harvard on latent inhibition, like do do the ability, like does your reticular activating system tune a lot of stuff out? What they find is that creative individuals with high IQ, creative individuals tend to be people with a high IQ who don't tune as much stuff out as other people do. But if you don't have a high IQ and you do tune stuff out, like if you, if you don't have a high IQ and you don't tune stuff out, it's associated with psychosis. And so it becomes very, very complicated. It's really interesting. So on a spectrum, it depends on how you fare on the other spectrum. It's like cooking. <laughs> depends what ingredients. Oh, wow. Interesting. Mm. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult to say this is what human intelligence is because we can't do, we, we can't look at the brain in the way that we look at other structures. And like we can test eyesight and we can test other ability. We could test hearing acuity. We could test all of these things, but testing intelligence cannot be done without subjectivity. Yeah. Yeah. And cultural influences and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. If you look at, if you look at any score, even a very good test, it is still, and there are very good tests that do give you a nice picture of how this person is thinking and how effective they are in their thinking. But in the end, it's still how that person looked on that day with that particular test giver and that particular instrument. And kids will do much better on certain instruments than others. You know, I love, I, one of my favorite, probably my favorite instrument really is not very popularly used anymore. And that's a Stanford Binet. And the reason I like it with gifted kids to evaluate them is because it, it switches around. I know you mostly work as an education consultant, but I do, I mostly work with people who are gifted grown-ups and many of them don't realize that until they are grown up and they look back and go, I look at all those things. Oh. And then they go through this process of grief. And well, first of all, lots of them struggle with the label. So maybe, we, and then they may go and do a test or they may not, but then they look at all the description and everything suddenly makes sense. Yes. Whenever I'm training teachers, almost always, I have never had this experience. Not when I talk about identification and assessment of gifted children, then I will always have someone come up and say, I finally understand my husband or I realize. And I, I tell people. Because parents, you, gifted parents have gifted kids, don't they? Oh, yeah. I tell people when you are working, I tell teachers, when you're working with a gifted child, you're working with a gifted parent and that gifted the parent family. has had trauma yeah. because I don't yes. know any, I mean, sometimes it's lowercase t trauma, right? Sometimes it's not capital C trauma, yeah. but, yeah. but it, the, a educational system not designed for you, but where you had to spend all of your formative years even if you were identified as gifted and even if you got good services, I don't know a single gifted individual who came out of their education unscathed. And those are people who were identified. If you realize as an adult, I wasn't identified, whether because there was something working against you or whether you came from a rural school district that didn't actually have a gifted program or like people my age, I'm 55, people my age, gifted programming was very, very spotty. You know, gifted gifted services didn't really become a thing until after 1957. In 1957, when the Soviets launched the satellite Sputnik, that was when everybody went, wait a minute, they're getting ahead of us. Maybe we better find out who our smart people are and teach them stuff. 
That's the, nobody cares about gifted kids. They only have gifted services so that they can eke out something that benefits society from them, right? Like it's not, it's not have the goodness of their hearts. And so get to kids, even the ones who've had a good education realize, oh, they were really just trying to train me as essentially like a work robot, like so that I could go to the jet propulsion laboratory and send, you know, uh, rockets into space for them, right? Like it's all, this is all conspiracy Mm -hmm. and get to kids and adults are more prone. And this is the primarily the work of Dr. James Webb of prone to existential depression. So a form of, can can we talk about what that means and what that looks like? Yeah. Yeah. So existential depression would, would on the surface look very much like MDD, like would look very much like major depressive disorder in the sense that it would, it would check all the diagnostic criteria in the DSM the same. However, the difference would be that in existential depression, it's where you are, you have a deep and accurate understanding of the world around you. And you find that the very existence depressing. Existential depression, a person is unable to be comforted by things that might comfort someone else, right? Like, oh, in the end, it'll all be okay. No, like, no, I'm on a planet that's hurtling through space in an ever expanding universe. And the only way off of it is to die. And everyone surrounding me is in varying processes of dying. And this is like, what is the point of this? And this feeling can come with children like three years old who their, their, their intelligence is enabling them to think thoughts. It's kind of like Wizard of Oz, but with the thoughts I'll, I'd be thinking, right? They, they think these thoughts that are too deep for them because they can't see what the other aspects of it are. And if that doesn't get addressed, and of course, you, you know that like, it hasn't been that long that we even admitted that children could have depression. And so if we have this and it goes unrecognized and we just have adults around them giving platitudes, then they can just have this low level sense of, of otherness Mm -hmm. that I don't really fit in here. I don't really belong here. Mm -hmm. One time I was working with a group of children in Mensa and this little boy tugged on my side. I will never forget this moment. He tugged on my side and I looked down and I said, Hey, what's going on? And he said, Mensa is my species, four years old, four years old. And it sounds cute. Like, oh, Mensa is my species. And for people unfamiliar, Mensa is a high IQ society for people who are in the top 2%, right? So, but I thought it was tragic because he already at the age of four felt so different from other people that he didn't even feel like he was the same species. And that feeling leads to this existential depression of like, even if I like my job and even if I love my family, it's all still a hot mess. Right. And they get very overwhelmed by circumstances in the world. Um, Very overwhelmed. I mean, I think we've focused on COVID primarily as a, a physical health pandemic, but the result of how we've dealt with it has created a mental health yes. crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's very similar to the mental health crisis that a lot of gifted individuals have done. One of the things I, I recently was asked, a couple of years ago, I was asked, what is your number one piece of advice for parents of gifted children? And I said, get counseling. Yes. Because you've got to ones as well. Yeah. You've got to heal yourself before you can help your child. It's just like on an airplane where you got to put your mask on first, right? Like you've got to be healed and, and, and giftedness comes from somewhere and whether it's nature or nurture, it's you. And you've got to make sure that you have addressed the pain of otherness, whether you were identified as gifted or not, the, the pain exists. I tell people, you want a really inexpensive way to identify gifted kids, walk into a kindergarten and ask the class, who's the smartest kid in the class? They'll all point at one kid. They'll point at the same kid. Mm -hmm. They know. Let's talk about perfectionism. What does perfectionism look like in people you work with? 
So how I define perfectionism is an unreasonably high expectation combined with a lack of self-love. So if you have very high expectations of yourself, but those expectations are reasonable, that is fine, right? As long as that's combined with mercy. So where it becomes problematic is when you have an expectation that's higher than what you're really capable of, or you expect that you'll be able to work at that level of capacity all the time without recognizing that we all go through you know, peaks and valleys of levels of energy, mental and physical. Um, so having a high expectation is okay, but if your expectation is too high or unreasonable, that's a problem, especially if you combine it with an unwillingness to share or show rather love for yourself, patience with yourself, mercy for yourself, a lack of self-love. So if you feel like your whole self-worth is tied up in performance. So we we see this manifest itself in individuals through risk avoidance, right? Where like, if I can't do it perfectly the first time, I don't want to even try. So they, they, they tend to kind of undermine themselves by embracing professions where they don't feel like they'll really have to take a risk because they might not do well, but then they're bored. And then they create problems and then they're constantly changing jobs. And that makes them feel even more like a a failure. And they go into this death spiral. Um, In the book, I talk about how one time my husband and I were watching a show called Hoarders. I don't know if any of the listeners have seen this, but it's about people with a particular form of an anxiety disorder and they surround themselves with things. And what's interesting is, is that you see these people in their everyday life. Like if you saw them in the grocery store, you would never know. Right. But they were interviewing in this episode, this one woman, and they asked her like, where do you think this started? And she said, um, you know, well, I was a perfectionist and my husband is like laughing, like she is absolutely not a perfectionist, but it, It made total sense to me because a lot of times perfectionists will come to this realization where I know I can't be perfect. And so I'm just going to give up, right? It's all or nothing. This mentality of I can either do it perfectly or I'm not going to do it at all. And that is a very unhealthy place to be. So perfectionism, technically, if we want to look at it technically, it does show up as diagnostic criteria for a couple of mental health disorders including obsessive compulsive personality disorder, but lowercase p perfectionism, I think is like any other human trait where it's on a bell curve, right? So we can be more or less perfectionistic and it doesn't mean it like, I I actually try to resist calling people perfectionists because hardly anybody is perfectionistic in all areas of their life. So they may be perfectionistic about their appearance, or they may be perfectionistic about their house, or they may be perfectionistic about a a certain aspect of their work or the way they want their coffee made, but they're not necessarily perfectionistic about all of these things simultaneously. That would lead to neurosis. Yeah. So is there a healthy functioning way of perfectionism, are you saying? So that's a, that is a big argument in the field. So Some psychologists believe in the term they would use as adaptive perfectionism and other psychologists believe that all perfectionism is maladaptive. So the psych, I am, I am a believer in the idea of adaptive perfectionism. So for instance, if you have, yeah, I I think if you, if it works for you, right, like anything else, are you just really, really organized or is it, or is it obsessive compulsive? Well, does it work for you? Does it cause you pain? Is it interfering with your ability to live your life? Do other people avoid you because of it? Do you avoid situations you would otherwise engage in because of it? If the answer to all those things is no, it's not a disorder for you, right? Like it's it's just your way. And so one time my husband and I were watching a, a video of, a, we don't watch that much TV. It sounds like we watch TV all the time, but we don't watch that much TV, but we're watching an episode of some like CSI show. And they went into a victim's home and opened up a drawer and like all the pencils were lined up and they were super sharp. And my husband was like, wow, that person is sick. And I was like, that's gorgeous, right? We just had very different views of it. 
And I absolutely do not have a disorder, but I like things neat. I like my pencil sharp. It's just how I am, right? So with perfectionism, you can have adaptive perfectionism where you like to do things well. You take pride in your work. You enjoy the process of the work. You like the result of the work. You clean your kitchen. You clean it really well. Other people think you're obsessive about how clean your kitchen is, but it's a daily joy to you. And I think to some extent, Marie Kondo has normalized to that, um, that it's okay to find joy in the, in the everyday. But there are some areas of life where it's actually important to be perfectionistic. So for example, if you have type one diabetes, we want you to be perfectionistic about testing your blood sugar and eating correctly and having your insulin levels be correct, right? If you're prescribed an antibiotic, we want you to be perfectionistic about taking the full course of the antibiotics, because if you don't, you'll develop antibiotic resistance. If you're a parent, we want you to be perfectionistic about making sure that you take your child out of a car when you get out, right? Like you can't leave your child in a hot car. We want you to be, we want you to get that right 100% of the time. So there are lots of areas of human life where perfectionism is not perfectionism in the sense of, we want you to do this exactly right every time where it's an expectation. If we're, if we're having brain surgery or someone we love is having brain surgery, we definitely do not want a a neurosurgeon to say to us in their office, you know, I do my best, but sometimes I mess up and, you know, I can mess up on you. It happens. I try to be patient with myself. We're going to be like, no, every time you're operating on someone's brain, I want you to be doing your very, very best and see a mistake as a real problem. Yeah. And so a lot of this has to do with the environment and the situation. And so that's why I believe that perfectionism is appropriate in some areas of our lives mm-hmm. and that the difficulty comes when we're trying to be perfectionistic in areas where it's not appropriate or where our view of what looks like perfectionism is wrong. So I think the, it's that people have a hard time accepting failure. I think because of other people's expectations of them from a very early age that they may not have even noticed. Um, You'll see it happen with little children where they'll do something one time and then the parent wants them to perform it. Um, And so then we get these gifted cocktail party tricks. And so then it's like, if you can't do it, you've somehow failed. And over time and over repetition, it leads to a deep seated fear of failure. Mm -hmm. It also comes from a belief that if you're gifted, everything should come easy to you. And so for those people, I would say, read Anders Ericsson's work. Um, He published a book called Peak on the science of expert performance, and you will learn better about what this looks like. And Mm. we have unreasonable expectations that because we have high ability, everything should come easily. Mm. And other people have that expectation of us as well. I've had to write articles on my website about how gifted kids still do need teachers, right? So I think one of the biggest pain is their disappointments in grown-ups from a young age and not feeling like they can really lean on anyone. Mm. Well, that's that existential issue, right? Am I really alone here? I'm really alone here. And I don't really have anyone to lean on. I'm too afraid to lean on people because they might let me down. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather do it all myself than be let down because I have very high expectations of myself and others. And that causes problems. It causes problems in interpersonal relationships. So I think back to your, back to your question about why, um, like what should someone do who wasn't identified as gifted when they were in school, but now as an adult would find value in that. I think that looking at it, trait by trait and seeing is, is this causing you pain? Is this causing you pain is, is where the real help lies rather than a number because giftedness is not, not all gifted individuals, even those who are identified as gifted, they don't all look alike. They don't all behave the same. It doesn't manifest itself the same. I have three gifted kids and they all function very differently socially and intellectually. your observation do they struggle with relationships or finding I, I i don't just meant friendship i didn't just mean friendship i mean like intimate relationship 
the state in intensity or well, intelligence or the, the complexity creates a problem? One of the ways it creates, yes, it does create a problem. And one of the ways it creates a problem is that gifted individuals from a very young age are ready for a level of intimacy and intensity in relationships earlier than usually the other person in the relationship. Yes. So, <laughs> and yes. that causes I a really lot resonate. Of mm. Yeah, it, it causes a lot of problems. They're 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 ready to like there's no such thing as a relationship that's moving too fast. They'll they'll meet someone and feel like like within moments like oh this is my best friend, right? Like and in children this is really damaging because the other children aren't ready for that yes. and then distance yes. themselves like they're put Me off by it, right? as well absolutely yes. Mm. yes and so i find that most gifted most gifted individuals seek someone in in their like best friend relationship and in their spouse who is within maybe 10 or 12 iq points of them like even if they haven't been tested if you went and tested them you would find that like we just think differently. So my best friend and I are within, we both were tested. We're the same age. We're six weeks apart. We were tested at the same time with the same instrument. We were in different schools. We didn't know each other then, but we tested within three IQ points of each other and we didn't know it. My husband and I, my husband is, um, I would say smarter than I am. He has a higher IQ than I do, but we're within 10 points of each other. My my children have are choosing spouses that way too. And so I think it does impact relationships because it isn't a matter. It isn't like, it isn't Darwin. It isn't like you're trying to deepen. It's that, it's that you want to be with someone who understands you. You want to be with someone like to put it at its most. Level. Yeah, you don't want to have to alter your language and you don't want to have to explain your jokes. And gifted individuals tend to have very strong verbal skills and they tend to like word play. And so they want somebody who gets the, the puns and they want somebody who understands that. And they don't want to constantly have to be dumbing themselves down because they have to do that all day. They have to do that in their everyday, all day life. And they want to not have to do that at home. Do you have any generic career advice for gifted people? This is a very yeah. hard question because I talk as though they're all the same, but... So I don't think they need to have, I don't need to think they, I don't think they need to work for themselves, but I do think they'll be happier if they have a job where they have a lot of autonomy. Autonomy, Yeah. So yeah. teaching. So I was a teacher. Teaching is a great profession for mm. gifted individuals because yeah. you have so much freedom in your classroom. Like you're in your classroom and you can, and you can be the, really creative too. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, and the better you are at it, the, the better you are at it. And the reward the, is immediate. And you, yeah, and, the, and you yeah. get rewarded for it. They want you to be good at it. Um, I would say like that, the, that for professions, anything with autonomy. So um, obviously working for yourself is great, but it doesn't need to be that way because a lot of gifted individuals are still very yeah, social. I was say, right? They get energy from people as well. A lot of them. Yeah. But pick a profession that attracts other gifted individuals. Don't put yourself where you're the only gifted individual in a group that is in a profession that doesn't necessarily attract other gifted individuals. This is why Silicon Valley looks really asky. And because you go to Silicon Valley and it looks like a convention of people with, with what would have previously been diagnosed as Asperger's, right? But it's not, it's just gifted and gift, high giftedness looks aspy. So you you but you get all these people together and they're functioning fine because they're with everybody else who thinks that same way too. They work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They're they're professors. They where like it's okay to be that. So I would say it's very important to pick a profession where it's okay. So um therapists, actually, I would encourage gifted individuals to consider becoming therapists and counselors because we need so many more who are familiar with it and we need people who who can who are really smart and quick because differential diagnosis of mental health is much more difficult i think than diagnosis of physical health because it doesn't have the blood test with very rare exceptions 
it's it's very difficult to test. So I would encourage it. And, and also therapists essentially work in that same way, right? Like alone, but maybe you're in a group, but it's a profession like you need because you need an advanced degree. It's already self-selecting. But my piano tuner is in Mensa. Autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Gosh, I, I love our discussion. This, these are things that you can't actually just pick anyone in the street to talk about and your experience and your wealth of knowledge and your honesty really contributed to how rich this conversation has been. Um, what are some of the coping strategies or advice you, you can give people who are struggling you know they they just say they feel like they might be but they don't really know what to do I'm not sure if they should go and take a test don't really want the label I mean any anything actually really from career advice to relationship I know it's hard when you don't have a specific okay. person but you've written books no I've but, got yeah I've got some ideas so the one thing I would say is the label let me address that label issue because it really wouldn't matter what we call mm. it right like we call it gifted and we, and people have tried to change it. They'll call it like high ability, high capability, like in the state of Washington, they like high cap kids. They don't say gifted, but everybody knows very quickly what it is. You could call it purple and everybody would know what it is. Right. So the label is, is the label problem is just a symptom of a broader social issue that we don't like to accept that some people just are smarter than other people. And that bothers us. And so whatever we called that would be problematic. So label aside, my advice, I'm going to give a couple practical tips. The first thing I would do is that I would suggest that the person make a list of what they consider to be the five character traits they have that cause them the most problem with either their intra or interpersonal relationships. So what are the five traits you have that cause you the most problem? Like for me, I could tell you off the bat, first one, impatience. Impatience, number one, yes. right? Okay. So then after you've listed those five, these are, these are the ones that, not the things that bother, like that bother you the most, but the things that bother, like that get in your way in like your relationship with other people or in your relationship with yourself, meaning like they lead to you being unreasonable with yourself or down on yourself. So list those, list those five things. Then Think about what is the other side of that coin. So for instance, if you are impatient, usually it's because you quickly see a better way to do something. You have an ease of abstraction. You, you, you see something that's abstract and you're easily able to see, oh, I know how this could be better. And you do that more quickly. So you do that with all of those traits. So maybe one of the traits is that you... Um, one of the things that you do or a trait that you have that causes you problems interpersonally is that intensity that you you want this super intense relationship. But usually what goes along with that is an extreme loyalty. Like gifted individuals can make the most loyal of friends because they're used to standing alone. So they'll stand with you in the in the worst of times. So when you do that, and you, and you take these five traits and you look at you, we look at them always from this negative perspective. Like I'm impatient and I, I'm like overly intense and it's hard on people then. And then you associate all of those with what the corresponding strength is. I thought that's so good. And, and then you recognize that if you dialed back that negative, what the trait you're seeing as negative, you would, you, you can't pick up one end of that stick without picking up the other that your, your strengths and your weaknesses are just two sides of the exact same coin. And that what you need to do is if you're in a moment where that trait that is perceived as negative is causing a problem for you, like I'm really impatient right now. And it, I said something I shouldn't have said. Then you think to yourself, okay, is it still working for me, right? Like, is the, is the, if, can I dial back my level of impatience while still keeping the, the good trait? And if the answer is yes, then get help on that specific trait, right? Talk to your counselor about it, read some books, work on it. But if not, like, if no, it's, 
like I need this at this level in order to perform the good side at this level, then just accept that humans aren't perfect. And sometimes you're going to irritate people and learn to be really good at apologies. But that's my second piece of advice. I think it's, wonderful. To be good I think it's a wonderful piece of advice. Basically, be honest with yourself. Look at the positive side of it. Try and alchemize it if you can. And if you've done as much as you can and it's still a pain in the eyes of other people, then accept it. Yeah. Well, because I think the tendency is to catastrophize mm. it. The tendency is to say, I'm so impatient. I hate myself. Right. I'll, I'll share one trait that's very, very common in gifted individuals, which is hypercriticism. Mm. Hypercriticism is a, a very common trait because they easily see how things mm. could be done better. They, they go into every situation, restaurants, in-laws, houses, everything, right? And they see how it can be done better. And that cause they look like they're jerks, yeah. right? So then what you have to do is say, okay, I'm feeling this. I need an outlet for it that's socially acceptable. And finding that, right? These are all yeah. tools. And so it, it isn't necessary. I love your phrase that to alchemize it. You're not necessarily going to do that in this situation with this strategy. What you're going to do with this strategy is figure out like water takes the path of least resistance. Think of how your trait can take the path of least resistance. If you exhibit that trait to other people, that's a lot of resistance. You're going to meet resistance. Is there journaling? Is there, can you have a voice app on your phone where you go for a walk yeah. for 10 minutes every day and just vent all this stuff just yeah. into that, right? Do you have a friend who's willing to listen to this? So where can you, where can you let it out? You need to have, I think that would be my second piece is to make sure that if you have a trait that you need and, and, but it needs a socially acceptable outlet that you really figure out a way that works for you um, that can make that happen. My last piece of advice would be don't apologize for who you are. Recognize you don't owe anybody an apology because you were born with a neurological trait any more than you would feel the need to apologize if you had psoriasis or eczema. You, you, it's just a human trait. You, you take no credit, you take no blame and move forward in, in the peace that comes from that. And if you do feel like it's, it's, that's oversimplification, then it can be helpful to simply write, a, I say oversimplification, then I say simply, but it can be helpful to write a letter to yourself, granting yourself permission to be who you are, and then read it occasionally. Just this morning, I called one of my kids. I texted one of my kids and said, don't pick up your phone. I'm going to call you, but don't answer. And I wanted it to go to voicemail. And I left him a message. And I just said, I want you to have this message that you can save on your phone so that if you're ever having a down day, you can listen to it. And I just told him all the things that I loved about him and all the things that I felt were powerful mm -hmm. for him and how blessed I felt that he was my child and how, how much I loved him and that I will love him forever. And I feel like we're willing to do that for other people. But my, my last tip would be, be willing to show love to yourself, be kind to yourself, be yeah. patient with yeah. yourself and, and, and make that patience manifest. Maybe leave a message on your phone for yourself and listen to it. Right. And really Counseling, I can't say enough um, about the value of counseling and helping you manage the things that are causing you pain because, you know, you don't, giftedness doesn't come with a manual, but at the same time, find someone who understands giftedness. I hate to say gifted people should find a gifted counselor, but I actually feel like that's probably true. <laughs> Because if your counselor isn't willing to say that they are, they're not the right person for you. Because if they're ashamed of their own identity, how are they going to help you be okay with yours? Thank you so much. You've given us knowledge, insights, research, and really practical tips, which is valuable. Very few people can do that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity.
I really do appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. For more, please head to eggshelltherapy.com. There you will find more stories, articles, and resources for people just like me and you. Bye now. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Moving forwards, never looking back. Just one more foot in front of all those countless others. And we're there.